It's really a privilege to be here to speak with you this morning. And you may be wondering, uh, why is it that at a conference about emerging contaminants, we're having a presentation about PAHs and coal tar, uh, given that we have known for a very long time uh, that these are contaminants. In fact, uh, in the case of coal tar, we've known for centuries. It was way back in 1775 when Sir Percival Potts uh, determined for the first time that environmental exposure could result in cancer. And this was for young boys, for chimney sweeps in London, who had increased incidences of scrotal cancer because of their contact uh, with the coal soot that was lining the chimneys. Um, more recently, but almost 100 years ago, the first um, relation, the first understanding that an individual chemical could cause cancer was in, 19, uh, excuse me, yes, in 1933 when it was determined that benzoapyrene, which is a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, or PAH, uh, could cause cancer. So that was the first incident of that. And since then, uh, numerous, um, numerous uh, coking facilities, dye plants, um, manufactured gas plants, and other facilities that have produced coal tar as a waste have been named as Superfund sites. And there's been quite a bit of research on coal tar and PAHs and environmental and human health effects since then. So in a way, uh, like Stephanie was talking about yesterday, we might consider that these are legacy contaminants. But today, I want to focus on continued use of coal tar um, in our communities. And what we've learned very recently, much of the research has been done in just the last five or 10 years, uh, about environmental effects. So I work for the US Geological Survey. This is the uh, environmental research arm, the earth science research arm for the federal government. And the USGS is not a regulatory agency. Uh, we don't advocate for any regulations. We don't make recommendations for public policy. But it is part of our mission to do policy relevant science and to communicate that science to other agencies, to the public, and to the academic community. And it's in that capacity that I've been invited here today. As part of the USGS, there is, there's a program called the National Water Quality Assessment Program, or the NAQA program. And one of the main objectives of that program is to identify trends in water quality. Are concentrations of contaminants getting better? Are they getting higher? Are concentrations decreasing? And if possible, can we determine why? The research group that I was working with uh, at that time, about 10, 15 years ago, was looking at a particular aspect of trends, and that's trends in contaminants that are associated with sediment. So things like chlordane, DDT, and lead. And the approach that we were using was to collect sediment cores from lakes and reservoirs and use those as archives of water quality or of sediment quality by looking back in time down the cores and then looking up to the surface, we can see our concentrations of contaminants increasing or decreasing. We saw some good news stories, not entirely unexpected. We saw that concentrations of DDT in sediments were decreasing across the country. Uh, concentrations of PCBs, concentrations of lead, and some of um, the other heavy metals uh, were decreasing in lake sediment cores. But a surprise, to us at least, was that concentrations of PAHs were increasing. And the reason this was a surprise was that uh, in the 70s and 80s, there were a number of papers that came out that indicated the concentrations of PAHs in sediment cores in remote lakes were decreasing. Well, that's because remote lakes, most of their uh, PAHs are coming from atmospheric deposition. And we've seen decreases in PAHs in the atmospheres because of the Clean Air Act, because of improvements in home heating, and because of use of catalytic converters in vehicles. So why then were we seeing increase in concentrations? Well, one big difference is that we were collecting many of our sediment cores from urban lakes. And in urban lakes, much of the contamination is coming in from stormwater rather than atmospheric deposition. So that was an indication to us that we needed to look for a source of PAHs that was coming associated largely with urban environments, or at least where people are, and that it might be associated with stormwater. 
So I want to digress here for just a moment and talk just a bit about what PAHs are. Uh, they're a very large group of contaminants. What they all have in common is they're based on the benzene ring. Now, benzene itself is not a PAH. It is a six-sided planar molecule, uh, six carbons with six hydrogens attached. But you can organize benzene rings in different geometric configurations with different numbers of rings, and every one of those is a PAH. Here's just a few examples, but as you can imagine, there are a lot of different configurations that you could come up with. And to make things more complex, we can substitute a carbon atom with a nitrogen or a sulfur or an oxygen, or we can substitute a hydrogen atom with a double bonded oxygen, a hydroxyl group, or a nitro group, and every one of these is now a different compound that's a PAH-related compound. We know um, seven different PAHs have been designated um, by the EPA as probable human carcinogens. And we know also that PAHs are ubiquitous, particularly in the urban environment, because they're formed whenever we heat or combust anything that contains carbon. So anything like uh, used motor oil, atmospheric uh, industrial emissions, and also products that involve the heating or combustion of carbon, like tires, these all contain PAHs. So it's been historically a challenge for environmental scientists to determine which of these sources might be the most important in contributing PAHs to the environment. Well, a first clue came not from our big national study, but it actually came from work uh, that was being done by the City of Austin Department of Watershed Protection, which is a cooperator with the USGS uh, in the state of Texas. And in the early 2000s, they had a project where they were measuring, collecting uh, sediments from small streams, actually small tributaries and even drainages uh, across the city and analyzing those for a large suite of compounds. Uh, these neighborhoods where the sediments are being collected, these were not heavy industrial or even inner city neighborhoods. These were the types of neighborhoods where we live and work. They were single family, multifamily, residential, light commercial areas. And in some of these drainages, they measured PAH concentrations above 1,000 parts per million. Uh, to put this into context, the concentration above which we would expect to see adverse effects on benthic biota is 23. Concentrations above 1,000 are on the level of what we'd expect to see at, in the soils of Superfund sites. So this, this was a very high concentration. Uh, a very astute member of uh, their research team decided to walk upstream. And when he walked upstream, he just saw some apartment complexes with parking lots, and he thought at first, well, maybe it's asphalt. But asphalt actually has relatively low concentrations of PAHs. So he took a harder look at the asphalt, uh, and he realized that it was coated with a black material. And that black material is a very common product used called pavement seal coat. So you've all seen this. In fact, if you parked in the parking lot here, you've walked across it. Seal coat is a product that is sprayed or painted on the asphalt pavement of parking lots of um, some playgrounds, of driveways, and it's marketed as improving the appearance of the parking lot and of increasing the longevity of the underlying asphalt. It's very rarely used on public roads, uh, and it comes in two essential formulations in the US. Uh, dominantly, uh, these two, there's an asphalt-based product which is mostly used in the western United States, west of the Continental Divide, and there's a coal tar-based product which is dominantly used east of the Continental Divide. These two products look very similar, they're marketed similarly, they're applied similarly, but chemically they're very different. Asphalt and coal tar are very different compounds. Coal tar uh, is present in these products at anywhere from 20 to 35 percent by weight. So essentially in a five gallon bucket about one third of that is coal tar or coal tar pitch. Uh, coal tar pitch is, well let me back up, coal tar is a residue that remains after the coking of coal for the steel industry. Coal tar pitch is um, achieved by taking coal tar and distilling it 
And during the distillation process, the lighter weight uh, chemicals are removed, they have commercial value, and what remains uh, at the end of that process is coal tar pitch. Uh, coal tar and coal tar pitch are both known human carcinogens, um, and they contain very high concentrations of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So to try and get a handle on what might be some of the most important sources of PAHs in the urban environment, one of the first places that we can look is simply at source strength, at concentrations. So in parts per million, uh, here's a compilation of PAHs, uh, PAH concentrations. You can see that asphalt does indeed have relatively low concentrations of PAHs. Um, motor oil is kind of interesting because fresh motor oil, when it's still sort of clear and amber colored when you first put it in your car, it has low concentrations of PAHs. But as our car engines heat it up and it circulates through the car for thousands of miles and it becomes in black, it then has uh, high concentrations of PAHs that have been formed during that heating process. If we look at our two different types of pavement seal coat, the asphalt-based product typically has on the order of 50 parts per million, uh, similar to what we might find in tire particles. And the coal tar-based products have, on average, about 70,000, uh, some products as low as 35,000, some over 200,000 parts per million. So at least on a concentration basis, uh, this is a very, um, potentially very potent source of PAHs. Uh, to put it into context, one gallon of off-the-shelf coal tar-based seal coat has about the same amount of PAHs as one gallon of used motor oil. So in addition to high concentrations, another question we might ask is, well, how prevalent is its use? So from what we understand from information provided by the industry, um, about 85 million gallons of coal tar-based seal coat are applied in the U.S. every year, which is enough to cover about 170 square miles. Now, I say every year because it's important to realize that seal coat must be reapplied because it wears off. Um, when it's first applied, it does indeed make the pavement look black. It makes it look like new. But the abrasive action of car tires and, in this part of the country, of snow plows abrades that dried seal coat into very small particles, which can then be washed off by stormwater, can be blown off by wind. And in fact, if you go out to a seal coated surface and you simply sweep up some of the dust on the parking lot, you'll find that there are lots of little tiny dried black bits, and those little black bits are the pieces of eroded seal coat. So we did that. Um, during our, some of our lake coring studies, when we were in different parts of the United States, we, were, we swept up dust from parking lots uh, across the watersheds, and we had the PAH concentrations measured at our national lab. This anecdotal information that we'd heard about the use of the low PAH asphalt product in the West and the high PAH coal tar product in the East seemed to be borne out by the concentrations that we were measuring in the dust, which was similar to what the city of Austin had measured in some of those, those drainage sediments. Now, we also measured PAHs on unsealed parking lots in the same watersheds, and we got very different results. So the thing to remember here is that these parking lots are in the same watersheds. The only difference is that they're not sealed. So they still have these other urban sources of PAHs, dripping motor oil, uh, autom automobile exhaust, atmospheric deposition, tire particles. The only difference is the presence or absence of the seal coat. Now, once the seal coat wears off, uh, there are a lot of different places it can go. It can wash off, as I mentioned, in stormwater. It can be blown off by wind onto uh, adjacent areas, paved areas or, or turf. Uh, it can stick to tires and be tracked off onto other surfaces. It can stick to the bottom of your shoes and be tracked into your home and become incorporated in the house dust. And the P lighter molecular weight PAHs are volatile and they are released into the atmosphere. Each of these different pathways has been the subject of a couple of studies, um, but today what I want to focus on, because this is a conference on emerging contaminants in the aquatic environment, is I want to focus on the question of runoff. Now it came to light in uh, about 
well, about seven years ago now. Uh, this was recorded by the Boone County River Keepers. They put, they put a video up on YouTube. They were concerned because a bank had seal coated a parking lot and that night it had rained. And all the fish for a mile and a half downstream uh, were dead the next morning. Um, in response to that, the Pavement Coatings Technology Council, or the PCTC, which is the trade group who represents the coal tar seal coat industry, they issued some best management practices and they stated that coal tar seal coat should not be applied before the sealant has had time to cure, which is typically 24 to 48 hours. Uh, but they stated that after that curing time, that there was zero to negligible risk to the environment. They also stated that these fish had not been poisoned, that in fact they uh, had died because their gills had been glued shut by the seal coat and they had asphyxiated. So this, this gave us two working hypotheses that we wanted to test. So we had a test plot seal coated uh, with coal tar based seal coat by a professional applicator. Uh, and we collected the runoff and we had some toxicity done, toxicity tests done at the USGS Columbia Environmental Research Center. I don't know, some of you here may know Chris Ingersoll. He was the lead toxicologist at that time. And so we used two uh, test species, Syria Daphnia dubia, well, affectionately known as a water flea, uh, which is an invertebrate that lives in the water column and uh, newborn uh, fathead minnows, or Pimophilus primalis. We tested both the undiluted runoff and runoff that had been diluted one to 10, so just a 10% solution. The uh, organisms were exposed for 48 hours, and at that time they were then removed to clean water and observed for another 48 hours. During that 48 hour recovery time, half of the organisms were exposed to four hours of UV light to simulate exposure to sunlight. Now the reason we did this is that PAHs, or some PAHs, are phototoxic. And what that means is that these PAHs can absorb energy from sunlight, and when they release that energy, if the PAHs have been absorbed into tissues, when they release that energy, it creates reactive oxygen species, um, which can destroy cells and damage DNA. So many PAHs have been shown to have their toxicities increase by tens, hundreds, or even a thousand times with exposure to sunlight. So let's look at some results, and we're going to be looking results for the sake of time. Um, at, we're going to focus on the Syria Daphnia dubia. So here's our control. This is exposure to runoff from unsealed asphalt pavement. Um, we saw about 10% toxicity, one organism in 10, whether or not the individuals, the organisms, were exposed to UV light. So we're going to use this as a control, and we're going to say that anything over 20% mortality is toxic because of the presence of the chemicals from the runoff in the coal tar-based seal coat. So taking a look at those results, first we're going to look at the results before UV exposure. There's a lot on this graph. Um, so I'll walk you through it. The yellow bars are the undiluted seal coat and the turquoise bars are the one to 10 dilution. Along the x-axis, you're looking at when the sample was collected, starting just a few hours after seal coat application. And our last sample was collected 111 days after application or a little bit more than three months. And then uh, along the y-axis is mortality. You can see our toxic threshold there at, at 20%. And if the bar goes all the way up to the top, then we have 100% toxicity, everything died. So what we're seeing is that for the undiluted runoff, we're continuing to see toxic effects out to more than a month after the seal coat was applied. Um, however, for the one to 10 dilution, we're not seeing any toxicity. So then the organisms were exposed to UV light, and at that point, we saw 100% toxicity across the board. Everything died, regardless of the dilution, and regardless of how long the seal coat, how long after seal coat application, uh, the test had been done. So this addressed the first hypothesis, which is that 48 hours is not necessarily the amount of time after which the runoff does not present a risk to the environment. Um, also, saw, we saw no evidence um, of seal coat covering any of the organisms. 
The runoff that we collected was tea colored. It was essentially clear, but kind of the color of tea with a little bit of black bits down at the bottom. Uh, there was no evidence that the, the fish gills had been affected or that, that the organisms had been, had been affected by the, the actual particles of the seal coat. So this addresses acute toxicity, but there are some other questions that arise, such as what about chronic effects or less visible effects? Um, so we were acquainted with a research consortium in France that looked specifically at the effects of PAHs on DNA. And they were interested in our research and they asked us if we would send them some samples to do some, some studies. They use a model cell line which has been developed particularly to look at the effects of PAHs on DNA. And the DNA, types of DNA damage that they addressed with this experiment here was a combination of effects from DNA strand breaks and alkylated bases. That's that one on the right, the little red dot there. Um, what that is is when an alkyl group attaches to a DNA base and that can cause misreplication of the DNA. They used a type of test called a comet assay, uh, which measures these two effects. And they looked at both the 1 to 10 dilution, like we'd looked at in the previous study. They also looked at a 1 to 100 dilution, so just 1% runoff and 99% control water. So in these graphs, we're looking at the 10% dilution on the top and the 1% dilution on the bottom. And in the comet assay, the higher the bar, the more the DNA damage. The bar on the far left is the control, uh, and then the open bars are the uh, cells that had not been uh, exposed to UV, and the white bars are those that had been exposed to UV in conjunction with exposure to the runoff. So what we're seeing there is that with the UV exposure, we are seeing significant uh, DNA damage uh, in both the 1 to 10 and the 1 to 100 dilution and they just tested samples out to 36 days after the seal coat application. So we're seeing here evidence of the possibility of, of chronic effects in addition to the, uh, to the uh, acute toxicity. Now more recently, some similar research has been done by a collaboration between researchers from NOAA, Washington State University, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, this work was first authored by Jen McIntyre. And they, here we are looking at the effects of exposure on juvenile coho salmon. Now this is runoff that was collected just two hours, the minimum drying time after the seal coat was, was, was applied. And you can see these fish are, are experiencing loss of equilibrium. Uh, and within five, five hours, all of the individuals had died. Now here, This is seal coat that was collected 207 days after application, so a little bit more than six months. Uh, the individuals are surfing and swimming at the surface and doing gaping. This is not normal uh, fish behavior. And uh, at the end of their exposure period, 55% of the individuals had, had died. So this is another example of acute toxicity. Now they went one step farther and they also looked at sublethal effects. Uh, using zebrafish embryos. Uh, they exposed the embryos to the runoff for 48 hours using the range of concentrations from just after uh, the seal coat was applied to more than six months after seal coat were, was applied. And they also looked at a number of different dilutions down to 3%. Now, we know that PAHs cause cardiotoxicity in fish, uh, toxicity through, through heart damage. Um, and this is primarily associated with the tricyclic PAHs, or those with three rings, which include phenanthrene, which is uh, present in very high concentrations in coal tar. And they did find uh, cardiovascular abnormalities, including cranial hemorrhaging and blood pooling, pericardial edema, collection of fluid around the heart, which is, is shown in that circled bar there. They also found a reduction in embryo length and eye size, which is shown with the uh, red arrow on, or the, the circled arrow on the left. And they also measured some molecular markers that show that um, the, DNA, the DNA is actually being affected. They were looking at CYP1A induction um, in the fish. And they found this for uh, most of the dilutions, and they found this for um, the all of the samples all the way out to more than six months 
after application. Now, one very interesting thing that they did find was that if the runoff was filtered through a bioretention system, it, re it eliminated all the visible effects of toxicity and it greatly reduced the induction um, of the CYP1A. So this does it suggest that there might be some remediation approaches that could be very effective for treating runoff from these types of sealed surfaces. Now, these last two studies that we've talked about are looking at runoff, but remember earlier I talked about the fact that uh, the seal coat particles themselves are abradable, uh, they erode and they run off. So what happens if those become incorporated in stream or lake sediment? Does that have an effect on organisms? So there have actually been a number of studies that have investigated this. There have been a couple of studies that have looked at individual species, uh, a species of frog and a species of newt, and they found that exposure to environmentally relevant concentrations of, of PAHs in seal coat, they actually took seal coat and spiked the sediment with it and exposed the organisms. This resulted in um, some problem swimming, equal, loss of equilibrium, difficulty in the individuals being able to right themselves, and some reproductive effects and some growth effects, and at higher concentrations it could cause uh, toxicity. There are some other researchers that look more at community effects, that looked at uh, abundance and richness of the ecological community and also found effects at environmentally relevant concentrations. So these studies have been trying to rep reproduce what we see in the environment, but what about the environment itself? What happens if we go out and we look at existing stream system systems? Do we see any effects? Well, this um, was very thoroughly examined uh, by a different USGS research group uh, located in Wisconsin, and they did a study in Madison, which was just published this year. They collected stream sediment samples from 40 different sites in Milwaukee and measured PAHs. They found that 68% of the sediments had PAH concentrations that exceeded that concentration at which we would expect to see adverse effects to benthic biota. So they exceeded that 23 part per million threshold. They then took the sediments and did toxicity tests with Hyalella Azteca, and they found a very clear dose response relation between the concentrations of PAHs, shown there as the ratio to the probable effects concentration on the x axis and the mobility of the Hyalella Azteca after they are exposed to UV. So again, we're seeing this phototoxicity effect associated with PAHs. Then they asked the question, well, where might these PAHs be coming from? And they took a very thorough weight of evidence approach. They, they use pretty much every diagnostic tool that, that that I can think of, and I'm sure that they could think of. They included looking at diagnostic ratios of PAHs in different sources and in the sediments. Uh, they looked at profile correlations, principal components analysis, mass fractions analysis, land use analysis, source receptor modeling. They pretty much threw every tool in the book at it. And each of these approaches individually pointed to uh, coal tar seal coat as a potential source, and Coal tar seal coat was the only source among all of these different approaches that was, that was uniformly identified. So let's take a look at some of their results. This is called profile matching. So what's shown here are the profiles in red of six different common urban pH sources. Uh, and what's shown in black, which is the same on all of these six, is the average pH profile for the stream sediments. And you can match these statistically, uh, which they've done using the chi-squared statistic, but I think even by eye, we can see that the best match is for the stream sediments and coal tar dust. This is dust, this is the average profile for dust swept from coal tar seal-coated parking lots. Another approach that they look, did was to simply look at potential correlations between PAH concentrations and different types of land use. And the strongest correlation that they found was for the percent of the watershed that was parking lot. Uh, they did not find a strong association between urban land use or between streets and roads, 
uh, the percent of the bacon basin as parking lot was the strongest correlation. They also used a source apportionment model, which is a statistical approach that says, okay, given the PAH profiles of known sources, what's the statistically best combination of those sources that would match what I see in a sediment? And when they did that, they found that PA, uh, that coal tar seal coat was uh, potentially contributing the largest amount of PAHs in the sediments. So each one of those bars there is a sediment that was tested with this approach. Uh, each of the different colors represents a different PAH source, and the orange bars are the contribution from coal tar space seal coat, which was estimated to be contributing about three quarters of the PAHs among the samples. So the results of this work were very consistent with previous research by a number of different groups using a number of different approaches that show that the particles that are going down, uh, down the drain, down the storm drain from the parking lots are indeed making their ways to streams and lakes and being incorporated in the sediment. So to summarize, um, we found that Coal tar based seal coat does indeed contain very high concentrations of PAHs and related chemicals. It's uh, very widely used in many parts of the United States and it wears off, so it is a potentially potent source of PAHs to the urban environment. We know that runoff from coal tar based seal coat is a source of both acute and chronic, uh, potential acute and chronic toxicity to aquatic organisms and that the seal coat particles themselves when incorporated in sediment also um, present uh, potential chronic and uh, potentially acute toxicity to aquatic organisms. Um, and I want to end with the thought that uh, a lot of people have been involved in this research, that independent researchers from the academic community, uh, from state, local, and federal government agencies these independent researchers have come to consistent conclusions about the use, about the chemical makeup of this product and potential risks to the aquatic environment. It's resulted in uh, 30 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals and about a dozen different reports. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, we do have a web page. Uh, you're welcome to contact me or my colleague, Dr. Peter Van Meter, either by email or by phone. And we do have um, some, our publications are available at the website, uh, as well as a couple of different um, USGS fact sheets that we've written. I do have a few hard copies of the fact sheet here at the meeting. If you'd like to take one home with you, please feel free to contact me during the break. Thank you.